Would you turn, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 14? Gospel of John, chapter 14. And verse 5. John, chapter 14, and verse 5. Thomas said unto him, that is, to the Lord Jesus, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Aren't there many people, and this is the question in their mind, how can I know? How can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no man, no one cometh unto the Father but by me. 222 years ago today, on July 15, 1799, a soldier in Napoleon's army discovered a black basalt slab buried in the mud near the Rosetta mouth of the Nile River. His name was Pierre Bouchard. He dug it out, not perhaps realizing at first what he had found. It eventually ended up in the hands of an Egyptologist and a linguist named Jean-Francois Champollion, and he cracked the code. That basalt stone had three parts to it. One part was in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Another part was in Egyptian demotic. And the third part was in Greek. Mr. Champollion spoke Greek. And he came to understand that all three sections of that stone, that Rosetta stone, were the same thing in three different languages. Knowing Greek, he had the key to cracking the code of what Egyptian hieroglyphics were what they said. There is a key to understanding the Bible. If you don't have this key, it, it, at times it can seem as confusing as hieroglyphics. And you'll wonder why. Why did they write about this? Why did God inspire this? But once you have the key, then you understand what the Bible is all about. That key is this. The Bible is all about Christ. Christ. That's why if you want peace with God, the Bible points you to Christ. That's why if you want the forgiveness of sins, the Bible directs you to Christ. That's why if you want to have eternal life, the Bible points you to the Lord Jesus. He is the key to understanding the Bible. If you want to go to heaven, God directs you to Christ so that you can know how to have a place in heaven. That is what I want to consider with you tonight. And I just want to ask you to think with me along three lines. First of all, why no one deserves to go to heaven? Why no one deserves to go to heaven? Number two, why anybody can go to heaven? And number three, why some will not? Why is it true, according to the Bible, that no one deserves to go to heaven? It doesn't matter how good you live. It doesn't matter how much you pray. It doesn't matter how much you pay. It doesn't matter what promises we make. It doesn't matter what efforts we employ. We are helpless, unable to save ourselves. The Bible makes that so clear. For instance, Ephesians chapter 2 says, not of works, not of works, lest anyone should boast or brag. Salvation is not something that we can obtain, and we do not deserve to go to heaven because we are sinners. I think it is remarkable. That when the Bible wants to convey to us how odious sin is, that it can find no better word to use than the word sin. So the Bible speaks about the exceeding sinfulness of sin. It doesn't speak about the exceed or the language isn't used, the exceeding awfulness of sin, the exceeding wickedness of sin, the exceeding horrible effects of sin. It just picks the word itself because no other word could be so telling and so communicative of how awful sin is, the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Now, it is impossible for either of the two speakers, and it is impossible for any of my kind hearers tonight to understand how terrible sin is. That is because we are sinners. We have always been sinners. Everyone whom we know is a sinner. We live in a world of sin. You can't ask a man who is drunk to explain to you what it's like to be drunk. You can watch him and you can learn 
that drunkenness gives a lack of, of uh, inhibitions, that a lack of control. But you can't ask him to have a cogent explanation to you because he's under the power of the alcohol. So you can't go to a sinner. You couldn't come to me tonight and say, could you explain to me how terrible sin is? Because I'm a sinner. If we're going to understand how terrible sin is, then we need to get that information from someone who is not a sinner. That's God. And when God wants to convey to us how terrible sin is, how odious, how sinful sin is, he uses, for instance, the picture of a person who has been stricken by leprosy. And then he, he uses it to describe us spiritually. And he says, from the sole of the foot to the head, there is no soundness in it. We're filled spiritually now. Our souls are filled with wounds and bruises and putrefying sores because he is conveying to us how terrible sin is. Of course, think of how ruinous it is. Sin ruins everything it touches. When sin came into this world, this world was a, was a paradise. God, when it came from the hand of God, God looked at everything he had created and he said not merely that it was good. He said it was very good, very good. And then sin came in. God does not warn us about sin because somehow sin harms him. God warns us about sin because sin harms us. It destroys everything it touches. The Lord Jesus illustrated this by tracing the course of a well-to-do Jewish boy from the security of his home and fatherly love all the way down to where he was feeding pigs by a pigsty. Now, I don't know if there are any Hebrews in the meeting tonight. So it may not strike you or me the way it would have registered with the audience in that first century that listened to that parable because you could not sink lower for a Jewish boy than to be involved with, with pigs, feeding them, eating the same things that they're eating, trying to, to quiet your, your stomach. But the Lord Jesus was telling us the course that sin leads to, it ruins everything that it touches. Adam opened the door to sin. And it came in and it wrecked God's creation and it ruined us. In the 19th century, it was not known that mosquitoes were the source of yellow fever. But in the United States, there were a number of hot spots that experienced serious outbreaks. Thousands of people died. In July of 1878, an outbreak of yellow fever took place in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, pardon me, in Vicksburg. Memphis was located just to the north, and the town officials closed the southern border. They didn't want anybody coming from Vicksburg into Memphis and bringing the disease with them. One man, a steamboat captain named William Warren, one man slipped past the cordon, slipped past the, the restrictions. And he came to a restaurant that was owned by a woman named Kate Beyonder. And he had his meal there. And then he left. The next day, William Warren had to be isolated on President's Island, quarantined, and he died. The first person who died in Memphis, north of that border, was Kate Beyonder. She died 12 days later, and then it started. It spread like wildfire. Corpses all over Memphis, corpses were everywhere. There was a near continuous ringing of the bells for funerals that were taking place. Half the city's doctors died trying to care for the people. This epidemic, until it burned itself out when colder weather came, this epidemic caused 20,000 deaths just in the southeast section of the United States. And it all came from one man. One man. Romans chapter 5 tells us that it was one man who opened up the door to sin. And by one man, sin came into the world and death by sin. So death has passed upon all of us because all have sinned. Sin is an outrageous thing. I know, I know it would be impossible for me to to convey this to you because it's impossible for me even to, to conjure it up in my mind. But just as I'm speaking to you now, 
There are heavenly beings veiling their faces before God in heaven and calling to each other that God is holy. You see, he's on his throne. He's the almighty. He's the eternal God. There was a time when those beings didn't exist. And the Lord Jesus called them into existence by the power of his word. And they understand something of the majesty, the supremacy, the greatness, the august nature of this being called God. He's the reason everything else exists. And then they look at us. And they see mortal, foolish human beings daring to sin under the gaze of the God whom they know is thrice holy and whom they will not even look upon. Because sin is such an outrageous thing. It is only the patience and the mercy of God that allows us to continue living once we have sinned. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you will remember when David had to flee from the city of Jerusalem because his son Absalom wanted to kill him. He and his mighty men, now these were seasoned warriors, he and his mighty men were leaving the city. And there was a man who was related to the previous king. He was a Benjamite. His name was Shimei. And Shimei walked along just above David. It was like they were in a, in a, a depression or a, a, a slight gully as they were walking. And he was, he was above them. And he was grabbing handfuls, fistfuls of stone and, and dirt. And he was, he was throwing it at these warriors. And he was cursing David, see? And he was glad of what was happening to David. Now, you understand how insane that was. In fact, one of the, one of the mighty men, one of David's warriors said, one shot, just give me one shot, that's all, and he'll be done. No, David said, leave him, don't touch him. But do you understand how absolutely insane for that man to treat the king who was holding his life in his hands, who with one flick of his finger could have ended the life of Shimon, and yet the man in his insanity was cursing the king. How insane, how mad, how utterly bereft of any sense is our sin in the sight of this being called God. That is why we can't go to heaven. That's why we don't deserve heaven. Sin is a treacherous thing. It deceives everyone who has it. It convinces every person, preachers included. It deceives every person into imagining he is not as bad as God says he is. When the Lord Jesus spoke about sinners being the slave to sin, the people who heard him drew themselves up in their pride and said, just a minute, you're wrong. We're Abraham's children. We were never in bondage to anyone. Now, of course, if you know Bible history, they were in bondage in Egypt. If you know Bible history, you know they were in bondage in Babylon. If you know Bible history, you know that many of them were in bondage in Assyria. And if you know Bible history, then you know at the very moment where they're so proudly saying they've never been in bondage to any man. They've been conquered by Rome and Rome was in charge of the whole area. And yet they had the audacity, the blind audacity to insist that he was wrong. That they were really not as bad as he said they were. There's one more thing about sin is it is disastrous. It always destroys. It always damns. It always brings loss and heartache and death and misery. And the only way that you could ever be saved is if there were someone who would rectify this, someone who would resolve this problem, someone who could remove your sin, someone who could reconcile you to God. And that is why I want to tell you why it is that anyone can go to heaven. Because sin closed the door of heaven to us. Humanity was debarred. There is, there is a moment in the book of Revelation that is incredible. I know there are many incredible moments, but just, just, just notice, please. For one moment, we are directed to a silent universe. A silent universe. John said that heaven, earth, under the earth, everywhere was searched. And there wasn't one person who could say, 
I will redeem. I will rescue the planet. I will save sinners. Not one. So all the great saints in heaven, Mary, Joseph, Peter, Paul, none of them could save. All the wonderful people on earth at the time, none of them could save. It struck John to his heart because he understood that if, if there were no savior, there could be no salvation. Because you see, we have been disqualified from ever saving ourselves. Sin closed the door of heaven to us. Christ has opened the way back to God. So I want to tell you why anyone, anyone can go to heaven. And that introduces us to the topic of the cross of Christ. My dear brother, Mr. Baker preached the other night on we preach Christ crucified. This is not just a part of the message. The cross of Christ, his death and burial and resurrection are not subsidiary. They are not peripheral. They're not something that we put in every now and then. I have a friend, um, a very close friend who was saved in meetings that um, she was coming to. Now, she lived near us and my wife was bringing her about 50 minute drive all the way up to Hatboro to listen to the gospel. And one night when it brought her home, instead of getting out of the car, she did other night. She just sat in the car and she said, do you think it's possible for me to get saved? And in a few days, she had trusted Christ. She moved to North Carolina. She lived far away from any place that I knew that preached the gospel. But she wrote me once. She said, I was going to a place. And one day the minister got up. And he said, you can tell when a preacher doesn't know what else to say. When he's run out of material, he'll usually start to talk about the cross of Christ. She was incensed. <laughs> she marched up to him when the meeting was done. And she said, listen, I grew up listening to that about the cross of Christ. That's not something you just add. That's the most important thing in the Bible. Yes, it is. This is the most important thing in the Bible. That Christ came because he loved you. That he came to die because he loved you. That that death was going to open the way back to God. You see, the provision that Christ made at Calvary was for all sinners. You are not excluded. He died to save the world. Therefore, he died to save you. He said in one of those marvelously sweeping statements that he so often employed, he said, I did not come to judge the world. I came to save the world. John chapter three, he said, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That takes you in because when he died on the cross, he died for all sinners. That's why John would write later in his life, the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. That's why in John chapter four, John recorded the language of those people in a city in Samaria. When they said to the woman who had talked to them, they said, now we have heard him for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the savior for the world. Here's the savior God has for you. Because at Calvary, Christ died for all sinners. Down through history, theologians and gospel preachers have used numerous terms to try and convey God's salvation through that wonderful cross. I like one that used to be used well over 100 years ago. There were preachers in describing Calvary. They called it the marvelous exchange. The marvelous exchange. You know what the exchange was? Jesus died instead of me. Jesus died in my place. Jesus died for my sins. That's the marvelous exchange. You can go to heaven because Christ died for all sinners. You can go to heaven because the provision Christ made was for all sin. Consequently, there are no hopeless cases with God. I don't need to worry. My dear brother doesn't need to, to worry when he gets up that he might tell someone here tonight that the blood of Christ could cleanse their sin and yet tell it to someone who has sinned so greatly that their sins can't be forgiven, but that's not possible because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses from all sin. You can't sin greater than God can forgive. And his grace is offering through the value of the blood of his beloved son to wash your sins away, to clear the record, to clean the slate tonight. 
if you will trust his son. You see, it's possible for you to go to heaven because the provision that Christ made was not only for all sinners. It was not only for all sins, but it was for all time. Never needing to be repeated, not requiring a repetition for some people. So the here tonight. We have the privilege in Christ's stead as though God were beseeching you through our human voices. We have the privilege of telling you that you could leave this meeting tonight with a reserved seat in heaven marked with your name. All because of what happened on that rugged cross when Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. So. If this is such a wonderful thing. Knowing here in this world, in this life, that you're going to be in heaven, knowing that no matter when you die or how you die or where you die, that the next moment you'll open your eyes in heaven. If it's that wonderful, and it is, and if it's free, and it is, and if it's being offered by God, and it certainly is, why? Why are there some people who will not be in heaven? Christ died for everyone. The gospel is offered as we sang tonight, whosoever. So why will it be some people who will not be in heaven? This verse says, whosoever believeth in him. There are a lot of people who believe in their religion. There are a lot of people who believe in their good works. There are a lot of people who would tell you that they believe in him and they believe in themselves. They wouldn't just use that language. But they would tell you about all they've done. And on the other hand, they will tell you of all the bad things they haven't done. Surely, if anybody's going to be in heaven, then they should go. You see, there's a, a stubborn resistance in the human heart. The Lord Jesus, he told us about that in a parable when he said that the language of the human heart is we will not have this man to reign over us. We will not. On another occasion, he said, you will not come to me that you might have liked. And I dread to think that I'm speaking to people in the tent tonight and you won't be in heaven because you just won't come God's way. You won't simply let go of your sins and come as a guilty sinner to the Lord Jesus. You say that sounds awful simple. I've got a lot of rules I follow and a lot of things I hope will get me there. And then you men and, and you Christians, you talk as if salvation were so simple. Let me tell you how simple it is. Two years ago was the last time that I was allowed to be involved in tent meeting because of COVID. <laughs> One of the Christians was dying. He was in a, a home for care, but he was very, very poorly. And uh, we went to see him. He really, he really didn't recognize us. We were told by the family, he might remember, you might not know. I visited his home many times. He's a good friend. He knew me very well, but not now. So it really wasn't clear who we were. But after we read and prayed with him, I said, Dick, we're going to just sing a song before we leave. So we're not the best singers, the other preacher and myself, but we gave it a shot. I'm reminded of it tonight at dinner when Brother David and I were talking about this Sunday school chorus. So we sang for him a verse and chorus of Jesus loves me. Now, if you're not familiar with that, those words, with that chorus, in Sunday school, children are often asked to point to themselves every time you come to the word me. Now, please bear in mind, this man couldn't remember his own name. Didn't recognize us. Had no idea what the name of his former wife was who was now in heaven. And we started to sing Jesus loves me. I took his hand when we got to the first me. And I pointed it to himself. That's when the tears came. That's when I let go of his hand. And that's when that point on the man who couldn't remember anything else raised his hand. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And he even got the last one right. Some children forget the Bible tells me so. By the grace of God. I'm going to be in heaven with Christ forever. All because Jesus loves me and he died for me. Let go of everything else you're trusting. 
and trust Christ tonight. And you will go to heaven. Gospel of Luke, please. <clears throat> Luke in chapter 24. Nice to see everyone who's joined us tonight. <clears throat> Luke 24 and reading from verse 46. The words of the Lord Jesus, it says, <clears throat> he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. I think what I have tonight will follow very nicely with what you have heard. You have heard about the only way to heaven. And I want to speak about this little word that we have been actually commanded to preach to everyone and anyone. It says repentance and remission of sins. This is the words of Christ. Our Lord should be preached in his name among all nations. This is why we are here today, tonight. What does it mean <clears throat> to repent? What does that mean? It's kind of a strange word, and it's loaded with a lot of, uh, unfortunately, religious terminology, the word repent. Uh, some people think repentance is a good work you do. It's something that you, maybe it's making a list of all the sins that you have done, uh, like lying or cheating or theft, and, and then getting down on your knees and saying to God that you're sorry for those things, and there's nothing wrong with being remorseful or regretting sin and bad choices. But that's not repentance. Repentance is not merely confessing all the sins that you have done wrong. Uh, repentance is not trying to turn over a new leaf or to uh, change your life enough. We talked to a lady and we asked her because she had come to the meeting and she had left the meeting with tears. And we said, why? Why are you not saved? Why do you think you're not saved? And she said, because I'm just not living like the Christians enough yet. And after coming to meeting for three weeks, hearing not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what she said. You know what she didn't understand? That repentance is not somehow changing your mind or changing your, sorry, your attitude to live like the Christians more. No, my friend, repentance is what I've just said. It is a change of mind, but not like a shallow change of mind. Like uh, I wanted um, beef and now I want spaghetti. No, repentance is a deep change of mind. And the way I, I will uh, illustrate it for you is when I was just a boy, uh, my parents put my older brother and I into something called the Young Marines. I don't know if you have that out here in New Jersey, but there's a, a fort right where we used to live in Battle Creek. And uh, the Marines, some of the Marines would train there. And over the summer, you could enlist if you were like, I was, when I say a boy, I mean only eight or nine. And they would give you a, you know, they would give you a uniform and you would have a sergeant who would make you do physical training and running laps and doing push ups and doing pull ups and doing sit ups. And marching left, 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 right, left, you know. And anyway, we would do all these things right to a T. We'd have to have our uniforms inspected, make sure there's no wrinkles. Everything was straight. The hat was straight. The salute was right. And as we would march, then he would say, platoon, halt. And everyone on the line would just stop like this. And then he would use a phrase like this. He would say, about face. You know what that means? It means right foot behind left foot. And everyone in unison, 180 degrees this way. And platoon, march, left, 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 right, left. About face meant a 180 degree turn. At the command of that commander. And everyone turned. That's what it means to repent. It is a complete change of direction. When we have heard tonight that the Lord Jesus is the only way to heaven, I need you to understand something. It is not, if you are not saved here in this tent tonight, it is not that your way and God's way are kind of parallel. And in life, you may have taken a few twists and gone down a few dead ends. 
you have a few more dents on your car. But really, when it's all said and done, his way is maybe really narrow and straight, but yours is right there. No, my friend, according to the Bible, your way and God's way are polar opposites. That's why the most loving, gracious, kind preacher who ever lived, his first message was this, repent, turn. That's the words of Christ. Matthew chapter 4, it says that when Jesus began to preach, he said, repent to religious people, to what we would say are good people, nice people, people who went to church. He said, turn, you're going the wrong way. And so repentance means an about face. It means a 180 degree turn in direction. Another thing happened to me. Uh, I had just gotten my license and we had taken a trip out to Iowa in the Midwest. And my older brother always drove on the trips. It's just the way it was. And uh, he was so tired that he finally said I could drive. And so I did, I, I had to make it like a big event. So I got nice coffee and everything, you know, I was going to drive. And so what I did is I, I, I got in the front seat and I took the exit and we're going to Iowa. That's 80 West. I just saw 80 and I went 80 East. There I was with my coffee. I met very well. I was enjoying it. Everyone was back there having a good time. And it's just keep going, you know, keep going. We're looking and the exit signs, when I, you know, he had, he had known the, the way he had driven there many times. It's like the exit signs are getting lower, not higher. And it's like, where are we? And he looks down 80 East. I was done driving. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we have to do, right? Turn about face. Friend tonight, listen to the words of Christ. Except you repent. You will perish. Everyone who is saved has made a complete turn. I grew up Christian home. I knew the Christian ease, the language. I could talk with the people at the church. I knew the hymns. I don't remember the first time hearing Jesus loves me. There was a day in my life where I made a complete turn from my way to the way, the way, God's way. Have you done that? Everyone here tonight, is there a moment in your life where you turn from your way to God's way? Someone asked me the other day, so you know you're on your way to heaven? I said, no, because my way wasn't going to heaven. I'm not on my way to heaven. I'm on his way to heaven, the way. What does it say? What do we hear? I am the way, the truth and the life. Friend, tonight, if you're on your way to heaven, you're not going. Your way doesn't end there. You say, but it feels right. It feels like I'm, I'm pleasing God. It feels like I'm doing a lot of good things. The Bible talks about people like that. It says there are ways that seem right to men, to us. It seems right. But the end is the way of death. My friend, what you are called upon to do, not by me, but by God. The Bible says God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You are called to leave your way. Leave your way tonight. And the gospel, while it is a kind invitation and sometimes presented even as a solemn warning, in the book of 2 Thessalonians, we learn this, that the gospel is a command. Christ is commanding repentance tonight. He is commanding re your repentance, your change. And it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that he will come to judge those that, what does it say? Obey not the gospel. That do not obey. That it is a command that you are hearing tonight to do what? What is the command? Repent. About face, not from me, not from Mr. Higgins, from the commander in chief, Christ, about face to every person here. Because, my friend, your way is the wrong way. It's wrong. I'll look at it in three, three uh, phases tonight. Your way is wrong because of the way you're living. The way you're living. Now, I'm not going to pick on any specific sin. First of all, I haven't gotten the privilege to get to know every one of you well enough to pick on your specific sins. But secondly, that's not our purpose. You know, the Bible says this. The Bible says that all of us are like sheep. 
that by our nature, we go astray. We wander, just like sheep wander. And then it says this, each of us turn our own way. It doesn't say each of us turn to drinking. It doesn't say everyone turns to pornography. It doesn't say everyone turns to theft. This is, this is the root of sin. Everyone turns their own way. What was the first sin in, in our planet? There was God's way. Do not eat of that tree. Everything else, everything else. Tree desire to make one wise. Anyway, they turn their own way. And as a result, every one of us here tonight, I don't need to know you to know that you have turned your own way. Maybe your own way is the way of pride. Maybe your own way is the way of theft or some of these other sins, but your own way is just this. I'm living content to not have God tell me what to do. I don't care what God has to say. Let me ask you here tonight. In the quietness of this morning, when you woke up, was there anything, even from your heart, even if you didn't say it, that basically was something like this, Lord, what would you have me do this Thursday? Did that even register in your mind that the one who made you, the one who designed you, the one who had a purpose for you for this Thursday. What, what does he want me to do? Or did you just live today your own way? Who cares about God? Who cares what he wants me to do? I'm doing my thing, right? We hear that all the time. I'm living my life. I've got my plan. I've got my goals. I'm doing it my way. Friend, tonight, that's sin in its core. My own way. That's all of us tonight. That was myself. And God has a problem with that because for all of us, he has his way that he wanted us to live. He designed us. He formed us. He made us. I've used this illustration before, but it's like a phone. It's like a phone made for a specific purpose, made to function in a certain way. And imagine if your phone, you took it out and you wanted to take pictures of an event and all of a sudden, it just didn't work. And all of a sudden, the other pictures you had taken, it just on its own deleted them. You know what's wrong with the phone? It's broken or there's a virus or there's something wrong because it's not functioning the way the designer made it. And neither are we. Neither are you and neither am I. If, we're in our, if you're in your sins tonight, you, are never, you have never functioned the way God designed you to be, ever. The Bible says that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. It's impossible. And so the way you are living is, I want you to understand this today. Please understand that if you are not a Christian, if you have never had a moment where you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, the life, turn from your sin. And today you are not living parallel to God. You are living polar to God. You are going in an opposite direction. Your way leads to death. His way leads to life. Your way will send you to hell, my friend. We all got that in this tent. Your way will send you to hell. His way goes to heaven. And so what you're invited to do by God about face. Turn. Repent. So when it comes to our living, <clears throat> when it comes to our waiting, and what I mean by that is sometimes we meet people who they come to meetings like this. And they're interested in salvation. They think it's a nice idea, but they're just waiting, procrastinating. There's going to be a day when they're saved. I wonder if I'm speaking to someone here and you cannot imagine an eternity when you're not saved. As far as you're concerned, someday you'll be saved. Maybe for you, it's on your deathbed. Maybe for you, it's when you're older, when you're done having your fun, when, you've done, when you're done living your life. For you, salvation that we've heard so clearly tonight, for you, it's someday. Again, that's your way. You know what you need to do? You need to turn from it. Because God says salvation is not someday, it's today. Today. It says it, I think, three times in the book of Hebrews. Today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today, today, Thursday, this Thursday in July. What you need to do is change your mind. 
That was what it was for me. Procrastinating forever. I wanted to have my fun. That's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to live my way. I didn't think that living my way was so bad. I didn't think living my way was equivalent to somebody who commits murder or somebody who uh, robs a bank. But according to the Bible, my way was going to end up in death. And I deserved that. I deserved to be punished for my sin going my own way. But I was just going to procrastinate to some great event, some deathbed experience, some cancer diagnosis to then flip the light and be saved. You know what I had to do? I had to change my mind. I had to about face. I had to leave my way because the Bible says, and I remember the day, the 22nd of March, 2003, and this is how it came to me, tonight or never. Today, today, you see, for some of us, salvation is important. It's, it's, it's kind of a priority. We'd like to have it. We, we want to have it in our life. It's like having a spouse or a family or a career or a house and salvation's in that. We want to have it sometime. It's important. But according to the Bible, salvation is not just important. It's urgent. It's an emergency. That's why the word that's used is a rescue. Right? Saved. You don't need to be rescued if it's not urgent. You don't need to be rescued if it's not an emergency. But salvation is an emergency, friend. And if you and your thinking, that's what we are here. We can't help but preach with emotion because this is our gospel in a very personal way, changed our lives. But our preaching is to target your thinking. And so I need everyone here tonight to think, please. If you're thinking that you'll be saved someday, I want you to know that God says it's today. Salvation is a matter of today. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And so what you need to do to change your mind. You need to about face. You need to repent. And so repentance, when it comes to the way we're living, <clears throat> when it comes to our waiting, but lastly, when it comes to our saving, how does a person get saved? How does a person become a Christian? I wonder tonight if in what you've heard by Mr. Higgins, and even in what you've heard here tonight, I wonder if there's anyone here and maybe you walked into this tent and you hadn't a desire in your mind to be saved. But just now, as you've heard about the consequences for your sin, as you've heard about where it will take you and about the holy God that is looking right now at your sinful life, life I wonder if there's someone in this tent who would love to be saved. And your question tonight is how? You've heard it already. Can I repeat it? The words of Christ. I am the way. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Lord Jesus is saying this. I'm the way to the soul. Christ alone. Only Jesus. No one else. You see, I don't know what it is for you, but I know what it was for me. I had my way that I was going to be saved. And if you would like to be saved, and if perhaps there's someone here and you've struggled with salvation, you have your way as well. I don't know what it is. For some people, it's taking a pilgrimage. For some people, they're very sincere. I walked through an airport a number of years ago, and at a certain hour on the clock, the whole people we were walking with all our bags they'll just bow down just bow like that sincere very sincere my friend tonight it's not about being sincere it's not about coming sincere it's about coming the right way see when it came to my way to be saved my way to be saved was on my knees with an open bible my way to be saved was bowing there beside my bed, reading John 3 and putting my name in verse 16. My way to be saved was reading John 14 and saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and then saying, I believe. My way to be saved was reading Romans 5 and, and, and trying to put the light on and, and put my name in verses and 
tell God I believe on my knees. You know, there's not too many moments I can remember as vivid as this, that when I close the book, put it to the side, got off my knees and fell across my bed. And I left my way to be saved. And then a verse came into my mind. But he was wounded from me. I couldn't tell you on that day. Yes, I grew up hearing the gospel just like you're hearing. But I could not tell you the difference between a transgression and iniquity. <laughs> I could not tell you what chastisement meant. But I knew this. He was wounded for me. That's God's way. And when I left my way to be saved, is there someone here in your way is I'm going to figure out how to believe. I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to repeat Mr. Higgins testimony, what he did. I'm going to repeat what you did. I, 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 when it's time to be saved, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to leave your verses. You're going to have to leave your way. And you're going to have to fall on the grace of God and let God save you, friend. Because salvation is of the Lord. The Bible says this. Look unto me and be ye saved. Not look to yourself. Not look to your own ideas. No. It's a complete about face from your way to be saved. And it's looking to the commander. It's looking to God. And you know what God will point you to? He'll point you to a cross. You know the man who's hanging on the center cross? He never lived one day his own life. When he came into this world, listen to what the Bible says. Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do my will. Thy will. Oh, God. Every day, this man who's on that center cross has lived not his way. He's lived God's way. Every single day, exactly what God wanted him to do, he did. And yet the Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, that all of us were the ones who were like sheep who went astray. Each of us turned our own way, but the Lord laid on him. He who never went his own way. He who never was a wandering sheep. The Lord laid on him on that cross. The sin of us all. He was judged as if he was the rebel, but he was the righteous, devoted son of God. You know why? So that there could be a way open for you and for me to be in heaven so that we could be saved. But as you've heard so clearly tonight, the death of Christ, and I will reiterate what you have heard. The Bible makes it clear that he is the propitiation. He has satisfied God. For our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. That there is a provision available that cannot be measured. It is an infinite provision because it was an infinite person who suffered on the cross. And he satisfied God because after he died for our sin, he rose again the third day, showing that God was satisfied with what Jesus had done when it comes to the issue of sin. So then I will close just where Mr. Higgins is closed. If that's how it is, that Christ, only Christ, has satisfied God when it comes to sin, that God is not looking for anything more than what the Lord Jesus has done, then why aren't people saved? Because they refuse to about face. They refuse to repent. They, according to 2 Thessalonians 1, will not believe the gospel. And the verse goes on to say, they all might be damned. Not the gospel. My friend tonight, the Lord Jesus has commanded us to preach this. Repentance. He has commanded all men everywhere to repent. I want to ask you here tonight. Will you repent tonight? Will you change your way, your direction? And will you turn to God's way? The way that ends in life. The way that was paid by the blood of his son. It's available. 
It's available tonight. But what you must do, what's your responsibility in it all? Not to have some vision of the cross. Not to read some special verses and somehow they'll strike you specially. Or all of a sudden they'll appear as gold or appear as red. No. You are commanded to leave your way. Turn to God's way. And the moment you do that, you will have everlasting life.